It is fear that keeps us separated because fear is false evidence appearing real. It's an acronym. F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Because most of your fear is based on propaganda. Now why is it historic? Because in 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over is yours. Before the world knew who Martin Luther was, God raised up a champion for truth. His name was John Wycliffe. He would later come to be known as the morning star of the Protestant Reformation, for it was by his hand that Jehovah would ignite the fire that would set ablaze the inferno that would dispel the gross mysticism of the Dark Ages. The chief undertaking of John Wycliffe's life was the translation of the Holy Bible into the English language in the year 1380 AD. To make such a translation at that time, said the theologian and church historian Neander, required a bold spirit which no danger could appall. Neander's words could be no more true, for in translating the Bible to the tongue of the common people, Wycliffe was protesting against the most powerful engine of religious as well as political authority, the Roman Catholic Church. In opposition to Wycliffe's object of making the Bible available to the people, the cry was made by the church that he was introducing among the multitude a book reserved exclusively for the use of priests, and thus was the gospel by him laid more open to the laity and to woman who could read than it had formerly been to the most learned of the clergy. By so making available the Bible to the common man, the priests proclaimed that Wycliffe was casting the gospel pearl to swines to be trotted underfoot. Initially, it was not Wycliffe's deliberate purpose to set himself in opposition to the power of Rome, but devotion to the truth could not but bring him into conflict. As the Pharisees of old, the papist leaders were filled with rage when they perceived that this Protestant reformer was gaining influence greater than theirs. But nonetheless, Wycliffe fearlessly struck out against the errors and abuses sanctioned by the Roman Church. Even while his hand was on the frigid handle of the door of death, when his enemies sought occasion to make him retract on his deathbed, his statements in opposition to the Pope and the priests, with firm voice, Wycliffe responded, I shall not die but live and declare the evil deeds of the friars. And live he did. When he arose from the inactivity of his sickbed, John Wycliffe supplied his countrymen with the most powerful weapon that he could against Romanism. He gave them the Holy Bible. Nonetheless, alas, as it is the plight of all mortal men, John Wycliffe was laid to rest in the grave. And yet, 43 years later, in the year 1428, the malicious priests by the order of the Council of Constance dug up the bones of Wycliffe, burned them, and casted them into a nearby brook. The brook carried his ashes into the main sea, and today they stand as an emblem of the worldwide dispersion of Wycliffe's doctrine. Even in his death, God used the hatred of his opponents to immortalize the profound impact of one of his faithful servants. John Wycliffe, the translator of the English Bible, was a Protestant. <laughs> E avanti, siamo fratelli, ci diamo spiritualmente questo abbraccio. My answer is no, because like John Wycliffe, I'm a Protestant and I plan on dying one. I'm a Protestant. I'm a Protestant and I plan on dying one. And I plan on dying one. Dying one. Dying one.
in the midst of an age that appeared to be a bleak bottomless abyss of vice and ignorance, another man was ordained by the living God to be a vessel through which his light of truth could shine forth to the world. His name was John Wesley. Born on June 17, 1703 in Epworth, England, John Wesley was groomed in a well-ordered Christian home where he was homeschooled by his mother, Susanna Wesley. From a young age, he learned to be disciplined, good-mannered, and hard-working. As an academic at the famed Oxford University, John Wesley quickly became distinguished as a very studious and pious young man. Upon his completion of his studies there, he was ordained as a minister of the Anglican Church. However, with all of these accomplishments, John Wesley had yet to experience the true peace of God in his own heart. Relying upon his merits for his own salvation, Wesley's soul was as the parched garden languishing for the life-giving virtue that only the grace of Christ can impart. But on May 24th, 1738, all this would change. For on that day, as he listened to a reading of Martin Luther's preface to the Epistle of Romans, he felt his heart strangely warmed by the eternal good news that deliverance from sin can be found only in Jesus Christ. It was John Wesley's passion for this truth that salvation only comes through the medium of Jesus Christ that led him to fearlessly strike out against the manifold delusions that were concocted by the Roman Catholic Church and thereby has immortalized his efforts as a Protestant reformer. In his now famous address, A Word to a Protestant, John Wesley said these words. Do not you call yourself a Protestant? Why so? Do you know what the word means? What is a Protestant? I suppose you mean one that is not a Papist. But what is a Papist? Are you desirous to know what these words Papist and Protestant mean? A Papist is one who holds the Pope or Bishop of Rome to be the head of the whole Christian Church and the Church of Rome or that which owns the Pope as their head to be the only Christian Church. In the course of years, many errors crept into this church, of which good men complained from time to time. At last, about 200 years ago, the Pope appointed many bishops and others to meet at a town in Germany called Trent. But these, instead of amending those errors, established them all by a law, and so delivered them down to all succeeding generations. Among these errors may be numbered their doctrine of seven sacraments, of transubstantiation, of communion in one kind only, of purgatory, and praying for the dead therein, of veneration of relics and of indulgences, or pardons granted by the Pope, and to be bought for money the doctrine of persecution. This has been for many ages a favorite doctrine of the Church of Rome, and the Papists in general still maintain that all heretics ought to be compelled to receive what they call the true Church, to be forced into the Church, or out of the world. Well might our forefathers protest against these, and hence it was that they were called Protestants, even because they publicly protested as against all the errors of the Papists. There's a challenge for you. So the protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe we now are all Catholics again.